Welcome uh, to Annotate, Automate, and Educate Driving Generated Open API Documentation to Benefit everyone. Um, as we've already been introduced, but I'll introduce myself again. Uh, my name is Melissa Mahoney, and I am a lead on the cloud documentation team at MongoDB. My co-speaker today is John Williams, who is also my co-lead on the cloud docs team at MongoDB. So today we'll be discussing how we moved our uh, API reference documentation away from hundreds of handwritten pages to a single generated open API spec that we use to dynamically display our API docs. We'll discuss the problems we were trying to solve. And then once we settled on a solution, how we got buy-in from product management and engineering to help us bring the API docs uh, uh, to life. We'll discuss some details of our implementation, as well as the lessons we learned from our first time running a really big cross-team multi-year project. And finally, we'll talk about what's next for our newly generated API spec and the way that the engineering org has embraced it as a solution for their own projects. So without further ado, I will hand it to John to tell us a little bit about the problem space. Thanks, Melissa. Before we outline the problems that we wanted to solve, I want to talk briefly about why leading this project was so important to our organization. We believe that we could offer our users an elevated experience by resolving crucial issues that they faced uh, and refocusing our team's priorities to provide the content that our users ask for. Now I'll set the stage. For MongoDB Atlas, we have 44 API resources that contain 220 endpoints and approximately 3,000 parameters, which, before we started our journey towards get generating API docs, were all documented by hand. We were trying to solve three main problems. The first is out-of-date docs. This presented a less than ideal user experience. We regularly received feedback from users and support engineers about this. Additionally, MongoDB offers several tools based on the API, like our Atlas Terraform provider. Issues in the documentation cascaded to issues with these tools. We needed to do something to provide our users with more accurate information. The second problem, we wanted the code to be canon because we already had several years worth of code and wanted it to be the ultimate source of truth for our reference docs, we chose to annotate the existing REST API using the Swagger Core Java library. If you don't know it, Swagger Core allows developers to add annotations to existing Java code to generate an open API specification every time that code is built. This way we can provide docs to our users that exactly matches how these resources work in production. Finally, we wanted to empower our writers. Since 2016, about 20% of our tickets involved creating or maintaining our REST API references. By greatly reducing the time we spent on API references, we can enable our writers to craft more visible, more engaging content that requires a human touch. This slide briefly describes our API documentation process before we began this project. We often went back to engineers several times when documenting a new feature to gather more information about how it worked. The docs sometimes lag behind releases when we were faced with tight deadlines. Sometimes our usual planning processes failed and new APIs were released without the docs team knowing about them. As you know, it's really difficult for people to use an API without documentation. We wanted to solve this problem and to ensure that the docs were immediately consistent with the code that we released. This slide also describes the workflow we wanted to have when we completed the project. More on that later. Now I'll pass it off to Melissa to talk about how we convinced our colleagues to join us on this journey. So after we had concluded that open API annotations were the best option to solve some of the problems John just mentioned, we needed to get the project out of our heads and into action. 
We propose that the documentation team would create open API annotations for all existing API endpoints and add them to the product code. However, going forward, any new endpoints would be annotated by the engineering team and then reviewed by the docs team. This was a major change uh, from our process that needed buy-in from almost every stakeholder in the engineering org and in ours, uh, from executive vice presidents to directors and engineering leads and project management. So how did we do it? We cleaved to one of the core values at MongoDB, build together, uh, to forge a partnership with engineering that was critical to success of the project. To get things off the ground, uh, we use processes familiar to our stakeholders. So at MongoDB, and I'm sure at many of your companies, uh, there is a formal process to propose new features, get them approved, uh, and add them to quarterly plans for work. We struggled at first uh, to know how to start as the docs team had never used engineering's specific process before, um, but we learned along the way uh, and it ensured that we were reaching the correct or audience in a format that was familiar. This also ensured that we had explicit approval from the engineering org and executives. One of these processes at MongoDB is called an initiative. Um, it's an umbrella that covers several large epics towards a common goal. We were fortunate that around the time we were looking to start this project, the company had just approved and begun an initiative to better enable programmatic users, um, which included projects like creating new CLIs uh, and setting technical design standards for our existing APIs. Uh, we were able to use this initiative to explicitly tie our project to company business goals that had already had buy-in. We spoke with the product manager for the initiative uh, who agreed to be our sponsor, and she connected us to the engineering team undertaking the work, who then agreed to become our partners as well. I wanna <laughs> express again that this partnership was crucial. Um, the engineering team that we worked with helped us navigate the code base. Uh, they reviewed our pull requests, they implemented fixes that we couldn't, uh, and they helped evangelize OpenAPI to the rest of the engineering org as our work was underway. And the last thing in this partnership is that we let engineering know that even after the work was done, we would not be abandoning them. Um, our proposal did put the content creation in the hands of engineers, which was a major change. So we also wanted to explicitly include a process to support them. Um, we laid out detailed steps for getting annotation reviews from the docs team. We put together internal reference information in our wiki, and we made ourselves available for questions. Uh, and we continue to do this uh, and reiter reiterate that we are here to guide, uh, review, and educate. I want to dive uh, a little deeper now on the rationale that we use in some of these early conversations uh, to get this partnership going. Um, we needed to demonstrate that not only would this benefit the docs team, because on its face, uh, <laughs> implementing open API annotations would mean less work for us. Uh, but also how it would benefit the engineering org and our users and ultimately the company. So for, for our team of writers, as we've discussed, the benefits felt obvious. Um, open API would mean getting 20% of our time back. Uh, but saying that to your stakeholder might not be enough. Uh, the key is what you're going to do with the time that you get back. Uh, by generating API, oh, excuse me, by generating API docs, we would have more resources for high impact pages that require our human touch. Things like getting started materials, expanded use case tutorials, and articulating difficult concepts. So I think we can all think of that moment where we have a really specific request around a complicated use case that your stakeholder wants a step-by-step -step walkthrough for. And now that's the kind of thing that, that we can fit in. For engineering, uh, we had to acknowledge that conversely, it would take them a little more time. Uh, they would have to now write annotations and descriptions in addition to coding. However, this process cut out the middleman, uh, so much of the back and forth that John mentioned in a previous slide, uh, and put the knowledge straight from the engineer into uh, the code and thus into the docs. So, um, you know, that saves everyone a, a bunch of time by process. And plus the resulting generated open API spec would give them so much more in the end, uh, a way to standardize our organically grown API, a spec to write tests against, 
that could help maybe detect breaking changes or potentially generate a change log uh, that could be used to later generate SDKs, which they would otherwise have to code by hand, um, that could, uh, could enable mock servers for users to then test the API. Uh, and finally, speaking of our users, uh, it means accurate, interactive, up-to-date API docs all the time, uh, which is, I think, something that we all can strive for. Uh, and then also a spec that they can load into their API testing frameworks. Ultimately, the generated spec is a way to build trust, uh, which brings better adoption and more community evangelism for the whole company. So once we were on the same page, how did we then coordinate a project of this size with every engineering team that owned an endpoint? Uh, extensive communication. Over the course of the two years we actively worked on this project, we completed four proofs of concept, uh, seven technical scopes and spec specifications, and we received approvals from over 35 stakeholders. And even though we then had those approvals, we ensured that we had ample resources to enable and support our engineers as they embarked on annotating on their own. Uh, we wrote extensive wiki pages on how to annotate with style recommendations for writing descriptions and examples of everything. Uh, we gave presentations at engineering all hands meetings so that no individuals would be surprised if they had missed our communications about specs and scopes. Um, and we created a Slack channel specifically for open API annotation reviews and questions with a Slack handle that would ping the writing team. Uh, and finally, we held a standing meeting for office hours uh, so that anyone could bring questions or PRs in review that needed help. Uh, so now with the buy-in of our stakeholders and our proposal approved on paper, how did we actually get this thing done? Uh, John will give us the details. Thank you, Melissa. I'll spend a little bit of time talking about how we implemented this project. The first thing we did is we implemented a scraper script. We didn't want to take any backward steps. The spec we generated must, at a minimum, retain parity with the handwritten docs so that users didn't experience any gaps when we published the new documentation. Using the Python library of Beautiful Soup, we wrote a script to scrape the handwritten API reference pages and ext extract parameter names and descriptions to a CSV file. This gave us a solid point from which to start the project and enabled us to build upon several years worth of effort that we put into the handwritten docs. Next, we started an editing phase. This project gave us a chance to take a step back and to revise all of the language in the REST API reference docs to ensure that we were using consistent and accurate language throughout and that we were adhering to our style guide. One thing we discovered is that we were often using different words to refer to the same concept. This gave us the opportunity to address this issue, ensuring that we use consistent voice throughout the documentation. For many fields, we added crucial information to help users understand how to use our APIs. Here's one example where we added significant detail to the generated docs that the handwritten docs lacked. We updated the data type and descriptions of these fields to provide additional context to our users. Next, we conducted an ETL phase, which is extract, transform, and load. Uh, and we generated annotation blocks. Uh, we wanted to make it really easy for our team's writers to quickly add the annotations for each of the resources that we were documenting. We decided to try to transform the edited fields, edited field descriptions directly into annotation blocks that writers could paste into the service code. After a ton of research and trial and error, we were able to produce pasteable blocks that were mostly correct more on that later. This slide shows an example of a pasteful operation block that we added to the MongoDB Atlas code. We received a great deal of support from our engineers during this project. We can't underestimate the importance of their willingness to work with us to provide a better experience for our users. They made the open API spec validation a required test in their pipeline so only pull requests that generated valid open API specs could be merged to the main branch. 
This helps ensure that a valid spec and valid docs generated from that spec are always available for our users. After we generated all of the annotation blocks, our writers pasted them into the MongoDB Atlas code. We worked with our counterparts in engineering to ensure that all of the required tests were passing, that we didn't break the builds, and that we didn't miss anything. Sometimes we did. Next, we inspected the output to confirm that the new docs achieved parity with the handwritten docs. And then we got approval from engineering for every pull request that we submitted to the repository. Even with all of the pull requests approved, we wanted to be confident that our users would have a great experience with the first publication of the generated docs. We conducted a smoke test where we visually compared the output of the specification to every page in the handwritten docs to ensure parity. After we resolved a few issues that cropped up, we felt like we were ready to publish. So we did. Uh, this slide shows a sample of what the new docs look like in production. A quick note on how we update the docs with the latest changes. Every day, an Atlas app services function pulls the generated spec from the latest production build. When a user visits the page in the Atlas doc that hosts the specification, the page is rendered client side in their browser using the latest spec to ensure that it's always up to date. And our documentation platform, who are also partners with us on this journey, are working really hard right now to speed up this process for, for all of our users. Now I'll talk a little about handing the responsibility for the API docs off to engineering and our current API docs workflow. As we close this project, we're now using the process highlighted on this slide. Atlas engineers are now responsible for adding and updating annotations for all REST API changes. Our documentation team is responsible for reviewing the copy in every single pull request. When the changes make it into an Atlas production branch, the docs are automatically updated and served to users when they access the page, like I mentioned earlier. As a result of this project, our users now have access to reference docs that are immediately consistent with the API code that's in production. Our process now has fewer steps, so it's easy to iterate more quickly when we need to. These are both huge benefits that empower our users to accomplish their goals using the Atlas REST API more quickly than ever before. I'll pass it back to Melissa to talk about the lessons we learned during this journey. Thanks, John. Uh, and it was a journey. Um, the initial spark for producing uh, generated API documentation with Open API started way back in 2017, uh, when a senior writer and an engineer partnered together on a Skunkworks project. Uh, that spark wouldn't really start to burn until the spring of 2020, when we partnered with engineering on the initiative that I mentioned uh, to better enable programmatic users and real research began. By that fall, the writing team had finished the copy audit and annotated around 10 endpoints as a final proof of concept. And after that approval, uh, we continued to add annotations to the code base through the following year. By summer 2021, any new endpoint introduced by engineering was required to have annotations. And finally, in summer 2022, after a lengthy testing and review process, uh, we published the API documentation. I think, uh, as you can see from this timeline, one of the greatest lessons we learned was however long you think a large cross-team project, project will take, uh, double it. What we thought might take a year ended up taking slightly more than two. Some of the reasons the project took longer than expected are related to these next lessons learned. Uh, one being raise awareness early and often. Uh, although we had buy-in from engineering leadership and we used the designated feature approval process, uh, we still found that many engineers were surprised by the process changes that the project introduced. Um, although no one wants to send an email blast, I think that sending a project update to the wider engineering org and maybe not just our stakeholders as we progressed probably would have raised better awareness among individuals uh, and prevented some confusion that then led to a rather lengthy uh, final review. 
Uh, I also think uh, we could have done a better job defining specific milestones. Uh, this might seem like a no brainer, uh, but because we had never really attempted something like this before uh, and we were using processes that were new to us, we struggled to define specific milestones or timelines, and that made it often difficult for our stakeholders to understand the state of the project at a given moment. Um, because we didn't have solid due dates, we also found ourselves sometimes deprioritizing this work for more pressing features or more pressing work, work which made things take even longer. Uh, we should have set as many specific milestones attached to dates as we could have, um, even if this only meant to keep ourselves accountable. Another lesson we learned is you don't have to automate everything. We spent a great deal of time trying to generate annotation blocks that writers could paste into the code. While it was nice to have these pasteful blocks, some of them had issues and required manual intervention from writers or from engineers to correct. We aren't sure it was worth the investment to try to generate these blocks. We probably would have saved time and writer frustration if we had constructed the annotations manually for each resource. Another important lesson we learned is the API code might need to be refactored, especially if you're dealing with several years worth of uh, tech debt. We discovered that some of our APIs weren't really compatible with the open API specification, uh, especially those that relied heavily on field inheritance. We had several instances where fields were reused in different contexts, making it difficult to describe at all using annotations. To publish a complete spec, we hand wrote open API schemas for these incompatible APIs. Our engineering teams are working to refactor the code right now to make it more compatible with open API. When we're able to remove the handwritten schemas, we will, achieve, we will have achieved our goal of generating all of the reference docs directly from code. And finally, uh, one of the most important lessons we learned uh, is a positive one. It's that as writers, uh, we can be a source of great change and process improvement in an engineering organization. This was the first time that we had paired with engineering so closely on what is now essentially an internal feature of our API uh, that is being embraced and expanded upon by the engineering org, uh, which John will take us through. Thanks, Melissa. I'll talk about how we're building upon the success of this project. These are some of the things that we're working on right now. Our engineering team is experimenting with generating client SDKs in several languages from the open API spec. If this is successful, we'll be able to leverage the work we've put into this spec to make it easier for developers to automate tasks in MongoDB Atlas using their preferred language without much overhead. Another thing that we're doing is we're writing more API tutorials. Our writers have refocused their efforts to add more tutorials to our docs. Now that we spend less time on the reference material, uh, we have more time to produce the type of high impact content that our users ask for. And finally, we want to take the lessons we've learned and use annotations and other contexts to automate documentation where it's appropriate. We've already done this with much success with the documentation for one of our command line interfaces, the Atlas CLI. But we're looking for other opportunities to take what we've learned and uh, expand upon it. So that is everything that we have for you today. And we are very happy to take questions. Thank you, first of all. this. Uh... I can see that it must have been uh, a lot of back and forth to to bubble up so succinctly what was a, an enormous process. And I think a lot of complexity was there that you didn't talk about for our <laughs> benefit. Um, what, I mean, in hindsight, now in 2022, I presume you may have asked yourself, why didn't we do this from the beginning? What are the, apart from buy-in, what are the technical things that didn't exist before that suddenly did, like these, these magical little catalysators or, or, or translators in technology um, that enables this? What happened? What's the change? Why didn't we do this from the beginning? In hindsight, we probably should have done this from the beginning. 
I, I think uh, resourcing was was the big issue where this was something that we always wanted to do, but prioritizing it over all the other work that we had and also engineering taking time away from their plans to assist us with this. Uh, it was always difficult to find the right time to, to, to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, once we were completed a few uh, proofs of concept, then it was a lot easier to get buy-in and to get everybody on board and then find the time to prioritize this project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think also that um, I think that open API is not not that old, right? Um, I think that uh, as a, a standard in the industry has only sort of become really widely adopted in the last couple of years. Um, I think that our APIs are um, pretty organically grown. Uh, and I think that, you know, designing to a spec like this was not a thought 13 years ago, you know, when the when the company started. Um, so I think that there is also a sort of a maturity uh, that's happening at the company in general, where a lot of our sort of initial uh, best efforts, we're now starting to standardize on a lot of different processes, not just here and with this and the API, but sort of across the company in general. I think we're just kind of hitting that maturity mark as a company. Mm -hmm. um, questions from the audience. Are you currently supporting multi-language documentation? Multi-languages in uh, human languages or in programming languages? It's not defined, so we'll have- I can to answer both. Uh, so <laughs> we are, <laughs> uh, we currently only produce our documentation in English, uh, although we're looking uh, to more global globalization initiatives in the future. Um, and we are currently underway in producing um, a whole bunch of uh, examples in different lang uh, programming languages uh, in our documentation. It's something that we are undertaking right now. I don't think every example is in all languages, uh, but we are rapidly moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. And, um, okay, I'm quoting, the swagger thing that collects the annotations from Java code to render the open API spec document, what was its name again? Well, Swagger Core, it's a, it's a Java library that you can import into your Java projects. And it has a whole suite of annotations that you can add to the code that map to uh, open API concepts. Uh, and you can also extend them. Uh, so our uh, engineering team is also looking for ways that we can extend some of those annotations uh, to do things with the documentation and with other uh, products that it doesn't do straight out of the box. Mm -hmm. And Dan is asking, could you repeat what your scraper script did? Sure. Uh, so in our source, we use a lot of uh, content reuse and a lot of variables. Uh, so we wanted to be able to pull the descriptions as they were rendered in our HTML. Uh, so we wrote, a, we wrote a script to read each of the API pages as they were on our live documentation site. Uh, and it pulled the the, the uh, path parameters, the path parameter descriptions, the uh, request and response body field names and descriptions, and put them all into a CSV file organized by the endpoint that we pulled that information from, uh, just so we had a single source of truth for all of the field names and descriptions throughout our entire API. Uh, and once we had that, that's when we began the editing phase. We did a lot of content deduplication, we noticed that we had uh, the same field used in six endpoints, but we had described it differently every single time. So that also allowed us to consolidate to all of that and, and make sure that we are using consistent descriptions where it's appropriate. Mm -hmm. And now um, from the audience, uh, if I understand correctly, you review all annotations added by the developers uh, into this pack. Does this represent uh, such a large volume need that the TechWriter team may become a bottleneck to releasing new features? Uh, 
So uh, it's true, we do review everything. Um, right now, we haven't seen a volume issue. Um, we're fortunate that on this team alone, we have around nine members, uh, nine writers on this team alone. Uh, so, so far, not an issue. Uh, and we also have a rotation. So we rotate through someone who's on call to do uh, the reviews every week. Um, we have, however, sort of foreseen that this could be a problem. Um, we did discuss this with our engineers and the consensus we kind of came to was, well, let's see if it works. Uh, and if it seems like it's becoming a bottleneck, uh, then we will change the process. Um, but at the moment, it seems to be working. Mm -hmm. And um, my prior conversations in uh, the API The Docs podcast uh, with uh, Anthony, he was also talking about uh, an uh, well, almost mythical onboarding process for uh, new technical writers where uh, they are for production in about six weeks. I still don't believe in what he said. So, so I guess that helps that uh, you're able to scale um, your, um, your team if necessary. Yes. Yeah. Um, from the audience, when uh, tech writers only review, um, does that change their product knowledge or expertise? Or if I may put this broader, um, what kind of um, expertise or, or, or shape of expertise do you change, do you foresee because of this change in activity or focus of activity? Do you think that your your i think right now we're more like t-shaped expertise of tech writers most of the time do you foresee that to change at least for yourself uh, I, I don't foresee it to change much because as we're developing the, the as we're reviewing the annotations that the that contain descriptions for how our apis work we're also documenting the corresponding ui features at the same time uh, and we're developing new API tutorials that show users how to, to use these APIs in larger contexts as well. Uh, so we're still getting hands-on experience with the, with the same features and with the same APIs. We're just doing it in a slightly different way. Go ahead. For parameter descriptions too, I mean, uh, if someone introduces a sort of an obscure parameter, which hopefully they don't, but if they do, we would have to get that information from the uh, the engineers anyway. Mm -hmm. um, as much as you look through the code, it probably may not be super obvious. So I don't I don't think that there's um, a, a big loss there either, because I think there was a lot of back and forth anyway on mm -hmm. um, knowledge transfer. Um, mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. How did you onboard developers to writing uh, in your style guide? And was it a synchronous communication, written communication, or did you do workshops? Uh, so we uh, did, let me, I'm just gonna read the question and make sure that I get it right. Uh, so we did, uh, we developed a whole wiki uh, and a shout out to Anthony that you mentioned here before who wrote much of it. Um, but there was an extensive wiki on how to annotate uh, and this is an internal wiki, um, but it includes examples for everything, uh, for every kind of annotation, uh, including um, suggestions for how to write uh, and how to follow style. Um, so that is sort of one of the asynchronous things that we did. Um, and then uh, in terms of workshops, uh, we ran, I want to say, I think just one, potentially two, I can't quite remember. Um, presentations for the engineering org. So we went to the uh, engineering all hands meeting um, and did a presentation there on what this looked like, what the process was, what the annotations looked like. Uh, and so we didn't uh, run a formal workshop, but we also held office hours and uh, John held them mostly uh, once a week, just an open hour for people to show up with their questions if they needed help with annotations or you know with uh, comments in a pull request. Um, so those were, we know, so I guess we never really sort of had a formal classroom setting, uh, but that was how we, um, tried to educate the engineers on, on how to write moving forward. Uh, and I think some of this happens too, sort of organically through the pull requests as they have written the descriptions and we review them, uh, we give them feedback, uh, and suggestions on, on the ways that they can, uh, improve it. So. Mm -hmm. Would you do it differently? which part all of it <laughs> i don't know like the uh, 
Human psychology, the open door hours, sounds a very unavoidable and good way, but um, also human psychology, I think it's a huge load on the person who's holding it also time-wise. Um, is there a way around those? Is it necessary? Um, John, I'd love for you to speak to this. <laughs> uh, so the attendance was pretty sparse for for the for the office hours for the q a i think i held them for about six months and i think i had somebody attend twice uh so it was definitely a pretty big time sink uh and participation was wasn't as high as we had hoped uh one of the things that, that we do that uh we do receive there's a lot more engagement in our slack channel uh, we have a slack channel where we have invited all engineers to participate and anytime they have a question about annotations that they're adding to code they can post in that channel uh, and uh, I at least prioritize answering questions in that channel uh, above a lot of other things because in order for this project to remain successful uh, we need to continue to communicate and like Melissa said uh, we don't want to abandon our developers and just leave them uh, to this project now I think that continuing so support is important uh, and that's been the primary venue uh, through which our, our uh, developers have been receiving that support. Mm -hmm. I can I can yeah presume a lot of positive effects also by simply communicating more on a specific thing. Um, I recall from a lot of write the docs presentations that chocolate cookies, cake, and such things are often involved <laughs> in such kind of uh, buy-in. <laughs> um, Thank you very much. Um, is there something that you would like to add that is often not talked about or cautionary or... I guess there is no, I guess there is no, no such thing as this kind of effort is only worth if you have so many endpoints. It's just do it from do it 30 years ago if you can't do it now, right? Yeah, um, I think uh, one thing I just thought of uh, as you asked that question is um, to sort of understand that, so this project for us was outside of our usual duties of, you know, documenting the future work that comes down through engineering. So I think um, really building space and however it is that you plan, whether it is that you provide a quarterly plan or you, you know, you sort of are have a more flexible workflow, um, making sure that, that this kind of work is also a priority and is prioritized against the feature work that you get requests from engineering to cover um, is something that I think we could have considered a little better because there were moments where we were like, well, no one's really waiting on this. We're just doing this to make the uh, the docs better. This is just going to improve an experience so we can put it on the back burner for now because we have all of these other things that we need to get done and document, which are going out in releases. But that once you make that decision once, then maybe you make it again. And then maybe things start to slow down. And I think we sort of saw that with this project. So um, I think that making sure that you uh, this goes back to timing timelines and milestones, but making sure that you commit to this work, which isn't attached to a release, just as much as you do for the work that is attached to a release, um, I guess is my cautionary statement. <laughs> mm -hmm. you might not always know the issues that you're going to run into when you yeah. undertake a project like this. Uh, we have one resource in particular that we knew was going to be problematic but we didn't realize how problematic it was gonna be until we tried to add the annotations to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were like, oh. <laughs> uh, so you can you can try to anticipate all the problems that you're gonna run into in this project, but leave a little bit of, of leeway for unknowns because if you do undertake this, you will probably run into some unknowns. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um... And we'll be back with the recap. So I hope this will reach a lot of people uh, and they can learn from it. Um, how may people find you if they would like to? Once they bump uh, into any problems. <laughs> um, I guess you can uh, find us on LinkedIn or in the API The Docs channel. You can find me in the Write the Docs Slack channel. Um, mm -hmm. 
I think those are all good places to find me, John. <laughs> Same. Same. Okay. Thank you very much.